The third presenter on this morning's panel will be from Dr. Linnea Tillett. Linnea Tillett founded her firm, Tillett Lighting Design, 32 years ago and has become one of the most respected, creative, and thoughtful practitioners of the art of lighting design today. As a designer and artist who brings a unique background in environmental psychology and public art to a technically complex field, Linnea has forged multi-project collaborations with significant practitioners, including Maya Lin, Kiki Smith, Michael Van Valkenburg, Toshiko Mori, in addition to a recent posthumous collaboration with Louis Kahn on the FDR monument at Roosevelt Island. Much like the medium through which she works, which is both particle and wave, Dr. Tillett's imagination negotiates seeming dualities between the prosaic conditions of ordinary space and their transformation into moments of the unexpected, between sight and understanding, between complex technical information in the ele of the elegance of the simple yet precise solution, which I think is very clearly demonstrated in her complex yet very precise work. From 1992 to 2012, Linnea Tillett was on the faculty at Parsons in the Masters of Lighting Design program, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome her back to Parsons today. Will you please join with me in welcoming Linnea Tillett. That wasn't the introduction we wrote. That was <laughs> lovely. Um, I just wanted to, to say, you know, and, um, where I, I sort of reached out and invited some colleagues and, and, and ex-assistants to, to come to this, and, and they were all very sweet, and they said, well, we're really going to come and try and see you present. And I was like, no, no, you should come and see the other people present. And I, and I, I feel totally, totally vindicated in, in after hearing these two wonderful presentations. So I'm a lighting designer, and uh, I and my studio, we, we work in, in clearly defined spaces, inside and out, public and private. We work in trains, in homes, in skating rinks. Um, we work in parks and pavilions. But the, the realm that we actually occupy our, our sort of psychic space is the time after the planet throws the world into shade. It's the time of civil and astronomic twilight. And we also work in the dark. Nighttime isn't a place or a space, it's a region. It's a region of the veiled, it's a region of the obscure, it's a region of the half seen and the mysterious, where edges and shapes blur, colors shift from reds to blues and then disappear and the world seems to fragment into tiny points of light light poles, ads, signs, and an anarchy of car and bus headlights moving in and out of view. People we encounter may have a lovely shimmer, a fascination, or a sinister aura, depending on the contributions of our psyche and the angle of the light. I would say that night is actually an inherently imaginative realm because to navigate, to live in a realm of shadows and obscurity and mystery, we must imagine it, feel our way around it, create stories and narratives. And in saying this, I'm speaking of the imagination not as a separate mental faculty but a deeply subjective way the senses have of throwing themselves out in beyond what's immediately given to create and grasp the world. You know, operating in this realm, this edgeless realm, 
my studio and I dance on a tightrope. On the one hand, we have to add light for convenience and comfort, a sense of safety and stability. On the other hand, we do not want to present experiences and spaces so clearly that they clip the wings of imagination. So we toggle between the poetic and the practical, struggling to maintain an equilibrium, balancing on the one hand between adding a faint and delicate light that leaves imaginative possibilities open, and on the other hand, I just have to, adding spotlights that grab and insist on attention. We look to add what the space requires, leaving a space for dreaming to flourish. What does this mean? What does this actually mean in practice? What does it look like in the studio? Let's see if I can. More dancing on the typewrite, type <coughs> tightrope. As a studio, we insist on site visits day and night before anything is built. We want to be at a specific site to throw our senses forward beyond what is given. We want to feel texture and layer more than can be given in a drawing or a program. I cannot tell you how many sophisticated, intelligent people landscape architects and architects who I've worked with who, when I say I want to visit the site at night, go, why? And I used to explain, and now I say, humor me. <laughs> so, when I go to a site, it is a kind of exercise in the imagination. I go to see what I cannot see, what I cannot feel sitting in the office. I want to smell the sight, listen to it, feel my balance shift as I walk across it. I go to find the unexpected, bats often, whiskey bottles tucked in the bushes, a certain magical tree, how stray headlights from cars brush across a bedroom window. We had a wonderful project a number of years ago <clears throat> that was out in Westchester, and we hadn't been asked to this site, <clears throat> and it was, a, it was an addition uh, to a Marcel Breuer house. And I finally managed to engineer a visit in February at night, <clears throat> and as we're standing there with all the trees have lost their leaves, and we're outside of the house, suddenly a car headlight appears. And it comes down this sort of hill leading to the house, and I watch it brush all the way across every bedroom window and disappear. And then the next car does that again. And those are the kind of things you learn and the kind of things that shape your sensibility, but which you cannot predict. I actually just got back from a site visit to see a residence that we're working on <clears throat> in Southampton and to see its landscape. And the existing house has been knocked down. And as the contractor said, the new one has not been built, so there's nothing there. <laughs> so someone from the client said to me, well, that trip was pointless. And I said, exactly. In the studio, we keep our imaginative our imagination and free play by exercising what the poet Keats, and you'll notice the poets get mentioned a lot in all of our presentations. So Keats, call, Keats called it negative capabilities. What are negative capabilities? We work to stay within our uncertainties, within mysteries, and within doubts without an urgent or irritable reaching after fact or reason. We are reckless, we exaggerate, we are vulnerable because the dark can make you very vulnerable. We are provisional thinkers capable from time to time of lovely pointless insights, some we keep, 
some we throw away. Empathy is a quality of the imagination that we prize. The ability to project oneself into another psychic space, whether it's a residential client or a user of a park or a whole community. To do what we do properly, you have to be able to imagine what others might feel. In some circumstances, it doesn't even make sense to operate as though there is a distinction between the imaginary and the real. And for a really great discussion of that, you could read Mary Rufeld's uh, essay on um, fear, which is one of the greatest essays that I've ever read on imaginary fears. On the subject of, of empathy, <clears throat> there's also the question of the other species that we, who inhabit the nighttime world that we work in. I think that there is a very important set scale of empathy that needs to be extended to these creatures. And I think sort of following Thomas Nagel, but in a, in a totally different context, he, he urged us to think, what is it like to be a bat? I think we would be far better lighting designers if we all took that imaginary leap and began to imagine what is it like to be an owl or a moth, or a tree trout, or a raccoon. I've found myself in the last few years very conservatized by the impact of climate change and global warming. Practically every project I've worked on, as well as multiple people's lives, have been impacted. Sometimes you have to acknowledge that things do impact you, and to keep your imagination foot lo loose and limber and wild, you have to say, I'm stuck. This is shutting me down. I, I, I just somehow can't really act freely. And then you have to take action. So from time to time, I invite artists to come with me. Sometimes there are artists perform it who work in opera or in dance, and sometimes they're visual artists, and I ask them to come to sites with me and to tell me what they see. And I do it with my senior designers. It's not to get just their take, but it's for all of us to look at something together and say, what, what else is there? So this is, this is a um, city in Connecticut on the water that when um, my then associate, uh, Charlie, Brocade and I arrived at, we were like, God, it's ugly here and sad. And we just have no idea what we might want to light. And the artist who we invited, Ray Agdogan, said, are you kidding? Look at all these wonderful things that are there. There's electrical towers. There's, there's ferries. There's the underside of I-95. There's, she just went. And we were like, oh, oh, you're absolutely right. It's really quite beautiful here. And then we began to do these drawings about how we might approach each one of these sort of rather somber and forbidding constructions and, and add them with a layer of reflective golden paint, how we might add light to the, to the environment. This is Syracuse. Syracuse in February, which is when I first went there, is rather a daunting and gray place, as some of you know. And again, I, I, I brought Ray Agdogan, Ray Agdogan with me, and we walked up and down the streets and walked up and down the streets, and I kept saying, what do you see? What, what can you see? And she, she saw how we might intervene in this three and a half mile corridor with a sense of humor and style and without thinking at all about where was a light and where was not a light, how could we bring color into this landscape? And it's, in fact, been a wonderfully successful project. So in a kind of conclusion, I would say that imagination is this act of dancing on a typewrite, a typewrite, and it requires skill, rigor, and a certain bravery. You're going to fall off the wire. The architect who was in charge of the Syracuse project said to me <coughs> when 
just as we began to work on it, everything we do here is a pilot project. It's a big imaginative exercise. But just remember, when anything we do fails, no one will remember that it was just an experiment. So I end with Michel de Certeau, who points out that dancing on a tightrope requires that one maintain an equilibrium from one moment to the next by recreating equilibrium at every step. And he quotes Kant, who says, in my region, in my village, the ordinary man says that charlatans and magicians depend on knowledge. You can do it. You know the trick. Whereas tightrope dancers depend on an art. Thank you. Thank you.